and casual uh, in many different aspects. I think that casual is a very special city that has summoned us together here because it's a very welcoming city. It's perhaps not the most beautiful city in Europe, but it's for sure among the most welcome cities. And uh, we are here for science, for technology, and I'm sure that many of you are also uh, out of Karlsruhe originally, but can consider yourselves um, from Karlsruhe, let's say. This is something that Karlsruhe says with Madrid, my, my original city, uh, which is also a very welcoming city. So the presentation of today is on design and additive manufacturing of the smart state morphing medical devices. And through this journey, we will even reach this uh, fascinating topic of engineered living materials that I have been also trying to develop, of course, with the help of colleagues here. First of all, a brief presentation of the product development laboratory that I am leading in Madrid. This is a laboratory in which for years we have been trying to apply the principles and techniques of mechanical engineering to life, let's say, to developing uh, healthcare uh, revolutions, if possible. And we, we are trying to cover the, the whole um, research life cycle from the very basic research line, which for us starts with the, with the cells, with the eukaryotic cells, and with the devices that are able to interact with these cells and take information from them. And that's mostly the area in which I have been collaborating with, with colleagues and friends from the Institute of Microstructure Technology here in, in Karlsruhe. In this basic research line, we are trying to develop some applications of this engineering, biofabrication, biomems. In some cases, these metamaterials and metasurfaces help to incorporate some special functionalities to these devices for better interactions at the cellular level. And we are also trying to apply some artificial intelligence techniques to the development of bio interfaces and bio devices. That at the most basic uh, level. Afterwards, uh, in this applied research line, we are trying to develop methodologies focused on open source medical devices to better co-create among uh, international collaborators these medical devices. We are analyzing how to share information in a safe way, in a traceable way, which is very important for medical devices. And in this applied research line, we are trying to innovate medical devices through the use of additive manufacturing technologies and through the incorporation of smart materials. Perfect, because this helps us to concentrate on this applied research line, which is the, the main topic of the presentation, especially on the smart materials for medical devices and on the application of additive manufacturing technologies for healthcare innovation. Afterwards, we are also collaborating with medical hospitals in, in Madrid, uh, trying to transfer some of the technologies or helping uh, spin-offs to, to develop the products. And for us, our main technology transfer line is through education. So what we try to do with these research projects is that they go to new courses on medical technology. So the index for the presentation, first of all, it will cover some introduction to these four dimensional printed technologies. Mainly you are using additive manufacturing, but you incorporate the dimension of time because you are printing objects that shape the uh, change their shape. Then we will see some ideas, some examples for 4D printing of safe working medical devices or bio devices, and how to empower these 4D printing capabilities. A step beyond will bring us towards this engineer living materials and to some of the recent actions that we have been performing on living carbon, which is a very nice method. The idea is, could we print medical devices that are able to evolve with the patients? So normally when you um, place a prosthesis inside a patient, typically it's stable on time. You want a structure that doesn't um, break, it doesn't modify uh, itself, but sometimes you need dynamism because our tissues are dynamic. All bodies remodel themselves 
And in some cases, you need these dynamic transformations for promoting, for improving the therapeutic approaches. In other cases, this dynamism is important, for example, for promoting minimal invasive surgical procedures. You have a device and you pimp it towards a very reduced uh, dimension. You introduce it inside the body and then it is released for performing an action. So the idea is as we were developing additive manufacturing technologies and applying them for, for the medical field, we started thinking about incorporating this dimension. And there are many ways in which we can promote these transformations. But it's not something very, 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 very new. I brought here an example from this shape memory uh, polymer-based medical instrument. It's a, it's a device for taking away from it, for a thrombectomy device. So it's made of a shape memory polymer, but it, in that case, it was cast. It was developed by the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory. But this idea of having a medical device that it, it's able to transform itself is more ancient. So even Charles Thomas stem, from which these stem uh, devices take the name, uh, he started with already in the 19th century, trying to apply some elastic wires for orthodontics. Uh, and in that case, the, the wires were changing their shape with time. And afterwards, on the basis of that, and with the development of special alloys around the 20th century, it was Palmas who introduced the expandable stents in the medical practice in the 80s from last century. So the stent is a device, it's this kind of um, spring. And you close it down, you introduce it inside an artery, and then it is expanded to promote um, blood flow. To also to um, take away, for example, uh, rhombi and this kind of issues. So there are different ways of promoting this 4D printing uh, of printing objects that shape and change their shape. So in some cases, and this is the most common probably, is uh, shape changes left by inner stress. So you print an object, you take it away from the construction platform, and then through the release of inner stresses, it deforms. In other cases, you can control uh, the shape through elastic or plastic deformation. You can control the shape by applying uh, pneumatic or hydraulic uh, actuations. In other cases, you can print mechanisms, and this mechanism, this kinematic change, can uh, modify the shape of the whole structure. In other cases, they are led by shape memory effect and by combining different kinds of multifunctional materials. So by printing with materials which respond to a stimuli, to external stimuli like temperature, heat, um, chemical action, uh, it is possible to obtain devices that change the shape with time. And this combination of approaches uh, brings uh, lots of innovations. So I'm bringing some, some examples that we developed in the lab uh, from the time of my PhD thesis and in the last years. So taking inspiration on these soft actuators from Whiteside's group, which were in this case achieved by, by casting, these are typical actuators from soft robotics. You have a structure which is very porous from the inside. You apply an pneumatic action and then it can expand and it acts like a soft robotic actuator. Uh, in the PhD thesis of Adrian de Blas, uh, he developed, for example, this proof of concept application. You have the, this gripper, and by incorporating pneumatic actuation by inserting pressurized air, the whole structure uh, bends. And you achieve something like this. This can be cost modded, optimized, depending on the material that you are using. And here you can see the actual actuation. It is a very simple proof of concept of a gripper, which is 3D printed using a photo elastomer. In this case, the typical problem is that some of these photo elastomers who you are printing them, sometimes they are pores and so on. And in terms of fatigue performance, they are not yet optimized, but I think it's a, it's a good example of safe changes 
led by pneumatic activation. In other cases, you can take benefit from the safe memory properties from polymers, but also from alloys, as we will see afterwards. So in this case, um, safe memory polymers, typically you manufacture them with a, a permanent geometry. When you heat them up beyond a glass transition, they become soft, quite elastic. You can train them by performing uh, the formation, and then you cool them down. When you cool them, uh, they stay in the trained uh, geometry, in a temporary geometry. And then when you heat them up, they recover the original geometry. So that's what we did. But in this case, using uh, a stereolithography and an epoxy resin, we were printing this stem. And afterwards, the stem was heated up uh, beyond the glass transition of the epoxy resin, and then compressed and cooled down. <coughs> and it stays in this uh, temporary geometry until a subsequent heating expands it. Of course, for medical applications, you don't want to heat inside the body. It um, can be dangerous, it can damage the tissues, but there are some uh, safe memory polymers that can be adapted to have these transitions at the temperature exactly or close to the body, which is quite promising, I would say. This is another example of a cool concept, let's say. It's an idea for treating septal defects, these communications between the left and the, the left and the right cavities of the heart. They are typically treated with a mesh or vortex or, or some textile. In this case, the idea is we have this mesh structure printed with epoxy resin in this case, and this flute-like actuator. So for training, we incorporate the mesh into the fluid like actuator. And then with these two beautiful toothpicks, we roll the polymer around the tool uh, in, the, in the hot stage, in, in this stage in which the polymer is quite flexible. And then we pull it down and it stays in this compressed state. Afterwards, through heating, it releases. So it could be like a way of inserting uh, the device in a minimal invasive way, and then it could be delivered. Uh, other possibilities, take advantage of the uh, possibilities of adding different factors for the development, for the development of very complex geometries. And this brings us to these microvascular safe memory actuators. You print the actuator, and inside the actuator you print, you leave some hollow channels. And these hollow channels can be filled with a hot uh, fluid, which activates the safe morphine. So the devices are printed as you see in the in the left image, and then they are trained. And we heat them up and we train them. We open them against this cone-like structure. And once the gripper is open, we inject hot water from the inside uh, through these two hundred and fifty micron channels, and then through this hot water it closes. It performs the action. In the case of the springs, it's the opposite. It expands by the injection of hot water. It's a nice concept of the microvascular shape memory actuators, which can have lots of application, even in the microscope. It, instead of printing with the laser stereolithography, we could print with, with a micro stereolithography system or a tool photopolymerization. And the idea is that uh, along these years, or especially just after my PhD thesis, I started to uh, play around with combinations of different uh, smart materials. Um, printed structures. And as you know, the family of multifunctional smart materials is continuously growing. So there are many materials in which you can uh, combine or through which you can combine different areas of physics because they act as actuators. You can have a piezoelectric and when you, when you apply a current, uh, there is a mechanical um, on your apply a voltage among the opposite uh, regions of the piezoelectric, there is a mechanical action, this is well known, but also the opposite. When you apply mechanical action of the piezoelectric, you can use it as a sensor. Uh, there is a possibility of, for example, using this pneumatic actuation, and you have the McKibben actuators, which are just inflatable um, elements, elastomers, and you inflate them, and through when they inflate, they expand laterally, and they 
WordPress, for example. Uh, the possibility of eating uh, shape memory actuators containing uh, geometrical changes and combines this heat and cold and, and the mechanical performance. And this is growing and growing, as you know, but the good idea or the good point is also that there is a growing number of smart multifunctional materials that can be additively processed. So typically we have seen additive manufacturing of um, polymers, uh, thermoplastics by fuse deposition modeling, or thermosets by digital light processing or laser sterilography. We have seen the selective laser sintering or, me or melting of steel alloys, aluminum, and so on. We have seen the lithography-based manufacture of ceramics. But normally you obtain parts which are just structural elements that don't change the geometry. The good point is that now it is possible to process safe memory polymers. Many of these thermosets have safe memory properties. It is also possible to process safe memory alloys. We will see some examples of laser powder bed fusion of methanol, for example. It is also possible to process heat electrics. So you can print a ceramic slurry and obtain a piezoelectric um, device with the geometry you want. So this continuously growing family of multifunctional smart materials which are processable through additive manufacturing is something we are trying to study and to promote. At the beginning, just using very simple combinations, here you can see some grippers, you can design these actuators, and here, for example, you can attach a safe memory string to the actuators so that it opens and closes. This is quite very simple. Or you can incorporate a heating resistance in that uh, device, which is a gripper. You train it, and once it's, it's trained, just by dual effect heating, you, you achieve this closing. Or we can use electro uh, wire needed to the structure of a mesh. And just by passing current, this mesh can be uh, can return to its original um, geometry. Those are quite simple examples. Peltier devices, we can use the benefits of the Peltier for obtaining multi-step actuators. So when you pass the when you apply the positive voltage, only one region of the Peltier is heated, the other is pulled down. But when you change polarity, it's the other one around. The, the first region is cooled down and the other is heated. So we can achieve um, a step by step actuators, as you can see here. So we apply, um, the, we activate the filter. This region is heated and this actuator, these flaps move. And then by changing polarity, these other flaps move to the others. So normally, for achieving this multi step actuators, we uh, polymers, you will need either triple shape memory polymers or these kind of combinations. The good thing is that also Peltiers can be now printed. I was using this kind of commercial devices, but now perhaps it's possible to print the whole structure with the Peltier. Or by incorporating devices that can, or materials that are hygroscopic. You can see here this a polymer block, which inflates with water and by inflating the structure of the actuator closes. This is just a rapid prototyping and very conceptual. And now the idea is what we are trying to do is to empower this shape morphing ability using different strategies. So for example, we can incorporate printable mechanisms or the printing of textiles. And through this printing of uh, kinematic chains, uh, interconnected elements which are movable, you can really promote the shape morphing. So for example, here you can see some designs of textiles and you can see these uh, warm like structures printed in a single step. So if you design taking into account the limits of the um, technologies, you can really obtain very interesting actuators. We can promote the shape morphing by incorporating special metamaterials into the design. And you can, for example, design a stent which has an upsetic um, geometry. And through this upseticity, you can promote 
of this negative Poisson ratio and obtain a more compressible stent geometry. Or you can use this pentamod like mechanical metamaterials for obtaining very, very flexible structures, let's say, that enhance the same memory uh, potential properties of the actual polymers that you are using for printing. Another option is to incorporate these um, designs based on compliant structures. So here it's a design of a stent for a arterial bifurcation. And you can see here that through this connection to this very compliant joint, you can really uh, obtain a very flexible medical device. And, and this brings us towards application. So we are passing from the very preliminary concepts already towards devices which have uh, some purpose. In this case, you can also incorporate um, very compliant joints, flexible joints, as you can see here, for example, this um, joint with a couple of degrees of freedom. So this can be compressed, but it can also rotate. You can incorporate this, this kind of joints into more complex geometries or this torsional joint, which you print in a single step and you obtain something which is extremely compliant say, for increasing the safe morphine ability. This brings us towards this ultra safe morphine actuators uh, by using uh, pantographic designs. These pantographic structures, it's printed in a single step. So it's quite challenging, I would say, to design something like this and print it in a single step. But this avoids post processes, which is quite interesting. If we incorporate some of these um, torsional springs, the specific nodes of these compliant joints, we can achieve like very special actuators. In that case, you can see that the only the single um, actuator incorporated in the center is not able to, to perform the actuation. But here you can see that every single joint has a different compliant um, spring, and it's a very um, reversible actuator, let's say, with an ultra safe morphine. Now it's getting more and more exciting because we are progressing towards high performance materials. So, printing with shape memory allows this is quite challenging, I would say. This is printed nitinol using. Uh, laser powdered bed fusion. And for example, you can see here an example, a very simple spring. So you expand the spring and then just by heating it up with a uh, fan, uh, it will return to the original. It's like the commercial you can achieve with white nitinol, but in this case, it's 3D print. And you can see different. Case studies here, uh, structures for stands, grippers, uh, and these beautiful designs for taking away uh, stones from the kidneys. So you can insert them in the compressor state, you expand them inside the kidney, and you take away the stone. The stone, and here is how it would work. Here to the left, you can see a video in which my PhD student, uh, Carlos Aguilar, is demonstrating the super elastic behavior of this um, 3D printed or 4D printed uh, knitting. In this case, he is crimping it with this machine and you will see how it returns to the original position due to the super elasticity of the knitting on and he performed a couple of cycles, which is enough. And in this other case, to the right, you can see a video in which the same geometry has been printed with a proportion of nickel and titanium that brings you to the safe memory uh, property. Instead of super elastic, it's safe memory. So you crimp it, you bring it to a temporary shape, and afterwards, by heating it up, so that's the temporary shape, and, and then they, they take the material, they apply the fan, there are many ways of heating it, and then it returns to the to the original, to the original position. It's open. 
Of course, this heating inside the body would not be nice. We are trying to employ more the super elastic when thinking of medical applications, but it could be for other robotic applications or space applications. And this is an example of recently printed uh, nitinol medical devices, different kinds of stents in which we are expanding this or enhancing the shape morphine through knitted or interwoven uh, structures. And here you can see, for example, this beautiful gripper and other devices for incorporating some electrics. And well, these are just uh, still conceptual, but already uh, progressing towards medical devices. A step beyond. So uh, we have seen these actuators, which are um, autonomous, let's say. They respond to external stimuli. They have dynamism and they are conceived for interacting with the human body. Perhaps this can be further improved by incorporating some liveliness into the material. And this is the, the beautiful area of engineered living materials, which is quite emergent. I would say the paper that gave this name to the field is from 2018. Although, of course, all these derives from tissue engineering, biofabrication, uh, actuations, environments. Uh, the idea is you have a material, and in this material, uh, you have both extracellular matrix, as in our bodies, and the living entities, which are the cells, the bacteria, the archaea, and the viruses are in between, but we are not dealing with those yet. So there are two families of these engineered living materials, as typically is explained by, uh, by the pioneering papers in the field. The biological engineered living materials, you have cells in culture, these cells, create the extracellular matrix that gives them a structure and the hybrid living materials in which you have the typical scaffold populated by cells. Together with colleagues from, from KIT, with Dr. Monsur Islam and Professor Jan Corbin, we developed this beautiful taxonomy for engineered living materials, which now the people are using more and more. And we thought that we could classify these materials depending on the actual living entities within them. So as happens in life, um, we thought that the living entity would uh, be the most important as you have in the biological taxonomies. So depending if you are using bacteria or if you are using eukaryotic cells, you have different types of engineered living materials. And it's the living entity that gives you the most relevant component of the taxonomy, the higher taxons, the higher rank taxons, because depending on the actual living entity that you are using, you can obtain different applications. So if you are wanting to generate energy or to perform photosynthesis, uh, perhaps some bacterial uh, living materials will be very nice. If you are searching for biomedical applications, perhaps you will need some eukaryotic uh, living materials. And the rank taxons are based on the actual structures of the materials. You have living metals, polymers, ceramics, uh, as is illustrated here. In between, between the higher rank taxons and the lower rank ones, you have the fila depending on the actual geometrical configuration. It is zero dimensional until three-dimensional or four-dimensional or even fractal. And we did this uh, study and we found that most people are working in these living polymers. So they are using either polymeric scaffolds with uh, cells inside with bacteria, archaea, and eukaryotes within for different applications. Many of them uh, applications directly connected to biofabrication and tissue engineering. And we saw some examples of using metals, composites, carbons, and ceramics. And then we decided to progress toward this engineered living carbon. Uh, and I will explain now the, this story on how we reach towards these uh, living carbon materials in machines. 
So for years, we have been working in these biomimetic design strategies, exploring complexity, using the additive manufacturing technologies for promoting um, very complex design, design freedom, for obtaining quite beautiful geometries. This one re reminds me of this uh, Reichstag building no? in, in Berlin, for example, or these functionally graded scaffolds, the vascular structures. And so we were able to design and manufacture these kind of things using typically digital light processing, laser stereolithography, but many of these resins that we were using were not adequate for interacting with living cells or with the human body. So our first contact with, with carbon was already a bit more than 10 years ago. We tried to use some printed prototypes uh, with laser stereolithography and to capture cells upon them. And the way of improving the biocompatibility in that case was the use of diamond-like carbon coating with a colleague from the Spanish uh, Hesic. Uh, we did some experiences with uh, hybrid 3D printed carbon fiber scaffolds. So we have these beautiful structures and inside with some carbon fibers. And we verified that it was a nice or a potentially nice replacement for some uh, ligaments, perhaps, or tendons. And that was uh, my first uh, contact with carbon. But then again, another inspiring visit to KIT. In 2019, um, I started to collaborate with Professor Corbin and with Musur. And we initiated this idea of um, okay, we have the printed uh, epoxy prototypes. Let's try to pedalize them and reach something which is classical. There were already experiences uh, demonstrating that. But we started to quite systematically approach this. Uh, here you have the beautiful same images uh, by Juan Monsur and some nice characterization results. And then uh, with the support of a colleague at UPM, Milagro, Professor Milagros Ramos, she demonstrated that these scaffolds were very nice for interacting with the sense. So first of all, with this lattice that you can see above, these ones, you can see the cells living there. And then with this hybrid fabrication approach, you have the stereolithographic lattice, and then you incorporate little um, cotton balls inside. And when you pedalize, you obtain this uh, beautiful multi cell structure which perhaps it's even more flexible or can have some applications for cartilage. So you can have functionally graded structures, some of them for the bony regions of an articular problem, some of them for the chondral regions, potential. And then we said, okay, this is a traditional tissue engineering scaffold. If we want to progress towards this engineered living materials, this likeliness, is always related to dynamism. So we wanted to achieve uh, safe morphine structures, dynamic structures, by applying some of the principles that we had already uh, presented. And among them, we started to design like a library of different kinematic chains. We started to print them to verify if these revolute joints or carbon joints, uh, different connections between uh, elements, between links, could be printed and help us progress towards shape morphing carbon. So these are the cut models of part of the collection with some scaffold-like structures, worm-like structures, concepts perhaps for biohybrid micro machines. These are the printed objects printed in a single step. Uh, it's tricky because uh, sometimes if you over polymerize the the parts don't really move. If you don't polymerize enough or if the gap in the revolute joints is too large, then it's not a true mechanism and it's useless. And afterwards, um, through different uh, systematic tests, trials, ideas, especially 
from the monsoon, we achieve this state morphine. So in the first trials, there was a stiction between the different um, links of a mechanism, but then through using a graphite powder assisted pyrolysis, it was able to obtain this kind of safe morphine structures. Uh, this graphite powder has like a duplication effect during the pyrolysis process, and then you can really print, pyrolyze, and reach safe morphine carbon structures, which are still concepts, but very beautiful, I would say. Was true living carbon materials and micro machines, we need the actuation. We have the structures which are dynamic. We control the multi scale, the different materials, so on. We have verified that the cells live within these carbon chassis, but the actuation uh, is still challenging. So it is possible to incorporate some coatings for promoting the actuation. We could hybridize these chassis with hygroscopic materials, perhaps, uh, use metallic coatings and activate them to electromagnetic fields, or perhaps use the cells as active elements. We have the muscle cells inside, and then the muscle cells start to contract. In um, If you are using cardio myocytes, they would contract uh, inherently. If you use muscle cells, you could just, like apply the adequate stimuli. So that's the idea, proposed applications as we summarize in this graph, smart scaffolds for tissue engineering, innovative medical devices, micro and nano biobots, probably living sensors, devices for energy st storage, for materials production, for space colonization. And with this beautiful picture of the Save morphine carbon uh, making breakdowns. It's like the final image of the presentation. I would like to fund the different funding agencies that support my research. And of course, I would like to thank uh, my colleagues at UPM, uh, my colleagues, friends at KF. Thank you very much for your attention. If you have any questions, please.